In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us. We thank you for giving us minds to learn about you, to know you, to love you. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our minds to learning more about you and to getting to know you more. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So um, I wanted to start. We're going to look at some of the hymns. Um, let me open this up. Let's share screen. Um, we're going to look at the um, hymns of uh, St. Ephraim. Afrahat, Jacob of Sarug, and St. Isaac of Nineveh. Um, and so uh, I wanted to start with this quote. We are influenced by Greek thought more thorough, more deeply than we are aware or like to admit. In literature, we admire most the qualities of lucidity or clearness, sobriety, and varied action. Orientals, on the other hand, never weary of endless repetition of the same thought in slightly altered form. They delight in pretty verbal niceties and the manifold play of rhythm and accent, rhyme and assonance and acrostic. In this respect, it is scarcely necessary to remind the reader of the well-known peculiarities and qualities of Arabic or Syriac poetry. Um, and so the uh, we come to so so last the last two weeks we looked at Ephraim's commentaries. These are something that is more Greek. Um, now we're going to move on to Ephraim's poetry, uh, which is um, more Eastern. And we're going to look at uh, Afrahat, who is more Eastern than Ephraim. Um, and then we're going to look up Jacob of Saru, who's kind of later than Ephraim, and Isaac of Nineveh, uh, who's, who's also further East. Um, than Ephraim and, and more um, uh, kind of Eastern Syriac tradition. Um, and so I wanted to start because we're going to look at some poetry and it's going to look kind of boring. So I wanted to start um, with some of these videos. Let's see, stop share, start share. So did, I think this came, if you can give thumbs up if this came uh, full screen, and I'm going to. Thank you. 
Um, so I wanted us to, to listen to this, to get an idea, uh, even if this wasn't the way that Ephraim himself was singing it, um, for, for example, um, the, the O vowel at the end would have been pronounced ah. So instead of aloho, it would have been alaha, um, in an, in an older Syriac dialect. Um, and the, the melody um, strikes me as, as a little more Arabized in influence. Uh, but you can hear, you know, kind of the rhyme scheme. You can hear kind of the, the, um, that in Syriac language has a lot of vowels. It's a vowel-based language um, and a lot of dense words. Um, and so you have these kind of shorter, dense words, and you're focusing on vowels. In English, uh, you can't focus on vowels. You have to focus on consonants. So if you look at the difference between Italian hymnody and German hymnody, you'll see this difference. So in Italian, um, they, they hold vowels out as long as they can. In German, you go fast. You go staccata. You just get as many words through as you can because there's nothing that you can really elongate. Um, we see the uh, the scriptural images. This is um, so they're they're claiming that this is the um, Saint Ephraim the Syrian um, of repentance. I'm not sure, uh, you know, exactly what what him it is uh, if it's authentic Ephraim or not. Um, but it was, it's definitely in the style of Ephraim. Um, we see the uh, frequent references um, to uh, saints, uh, to scriptures, um, and absolve me um, like that of Zakay. I think, um, I, I, don't, I don't even get that reference. I, I, I was thinking it was... Uh, the priest, but um, I'm not sure. Sorry. Um, and we see um, uh, prayers and fasting. Um, there's a there's a refrain: "Rahem ale aloho." 
have mercy on me, O God. Um, and we see kind of this O sound that's ending. And salmo and yaumo. Oh, wow. That's that's beautiful uh, rhyme scheme. In the English, fasting and day. You know, so you lose a lot of the poetry. Um, also, sometimes you'll see uh, a word that has like a double meaning or two words that sound the same. Um, I don't have any particular examples. There's a there's another kind of uh, interesting thing. Um, some beautiful imagery. You know, I'm drowning in my sins like an ocean. Um, well, where is it? Let me see. There is a. a does, did anyone of you notice the word for hidden things, or which they trans? transport here no and they translate here as as knowledge um so yoda have you heard the word yoda what who is yoda from star wars so his name is syriac uh, they uh, they called the semitics department at cua and asked for a name for a wise teacher and they gave them Yoda, um, real American pop culture, um, bearing the yoke of the priesthood without his service and splendor, have mercy upon me, God. So like Elisha. Um, so what I, I wanted us to start there so that we're thinking about this poetry poetically. We're thinking about this poetry uh, as something that's not only theologically deep, but also beautiful. Um, and so when you go into a church and you see art, the art speaks to you. And the art speaks to you um, not only um, because it has theological ideas in it, it speaks to you also because of its beauty. And so I could um, take 10 theological ideas um, and I could write them out. Um, God's love is like a shepherd. We are like sheep because we are helpless and dumb. Um, or I could paint a picture of Jesus as the good shepherd holding a sheep. And so there's something that's lost in the translation of going from a painting into written language. And so there's something that's lost going from poetry into a different written language. There's something that's lost in translation. Um, and so in many ways, we are uh, reading the plot summary um, of a famous movie, or we're reading uh, a description of a famous piece of art. Um, and so to think of what we're doing when we're reading Ephraim in, in kind of that light, rather than uh, something like um, Aristotle or Plato that maybe, or Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, you can definitely just translate. You know, there's no uh, no artistic beauty in in uh, the Summa. I mean, there are people. There will be people that disagree with me, but whatever. He, he's a good poet. He writes some poems oh. and songs, but uh, we have uh, you know his uh, shares. Am I still sharing screen? Stop share. Oh, stop share. Okay. Ah, no. The uh, computer. Um, technical problems. So the next thing I wanted to do, I wanted to dive into um, Ephraim the Syrians' hymn on paradise. So this. Um, This link that I shared shared with you, it has a lot of Ephraim's hymns translated into English, nice academic translations. And I wanted to look at hymn one. I'm going to minimize this so that it's not in my way while I'm reading. Um, so here they give this little this little summary. 
At the outset, St. Ephraim emphasizes that the biblical narrative concerning paradise in Genesis 2 through 3 contains much more profound teaching than any literal reading of the text would suggest. Our reading of it should accordingly be accompanied by a sense both of awe and of love. Only then will the inner vision be enabled to perceive something of the profundity of its meaning. So this idea of inner vision. So he's talking not only to our mind, but also to our, our heart. Uh, he's talking to the luminous eye. Um, this idea of the, the eye that sees clearly the reality of things. Um, and we hear about paradise. And paradise, it's Eden, where Adam and Eve were, and paradise is heaven. So kind of both of these things at the same time. The second half of the poem concerns the topographical relationship of paradise to the fallen world, first in the context of Adam and his immediate descendants, and then from an eschatological point of view, based on the parable of Lazarus and Richard. He's combining Genesis chapter 2 through 3 and Luke chapter 16, 19 through 31, like combine in some other verses as well. Now, remember, we read um, some of these same passages when we were looking at Ephraim's commentary on Genesis. So this is going to be more poetic, uh, but it's going to be less linear. Um, and so therefore, it's going to be more Semitic, more Eastern. So Moses, who instructs all men with his celestial writings, he, the master of the Hebrews, has instructed us in his teaching, the law which constitutes a very treasure house of revelations, wherein is revealed the tale of the garden, described by things visible, but glorious for what lies hidden. So Moses wrote the Torah. He was a great leader of the Jewish people. Um, it's a Beit Gazo. Uh, no, that's a, a treasure house, uh, a Beit Gazo of revelation. So a treasure house of revelations. Um, and so there's a hidden and a visible meaning. Spoken of in few words, yet wondrous its many plants. Praise righteousness exalts those who prove who which exalts those who prove victorious. So this is a claim. You have to remember this is a so every once in a while, I'll annoy you. And, and if I remember, read this refrain. I, I took my stand halfway between awe and love. A yearning for paradise invited me to explore it, but awe at its majesty restrained me from my search. With wisdom, however, I reconciled the two. I revered what lay hidden and meditated on what was revealed. The aim of my search was to gain profit. The aim of my silence was to find succor. So first he's describing the mystical state that he's entering into as he's reading scripture and preparing. I'm standing halfway between awe and love. So awe uh, or fear of the Lord. Um, in, in the Proverbs, it says fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So the first thing that we have to understand is that God is God and we are not. And what it means for God to be God and us to not be God. And then we come to this position of love. Perfect love casts out all fear. Um, and so awe and love. He's standing there kind of in the middle of this mystical, these two mystical states. Awe um, or fear of the Lord and love. Um, and he's reconciling the two um, with wisdom. Uh, so again, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Um, so now he's maybe talking about three mystical states, fear of the Lord, and then wisdom, and then love. And so he's kind of standing there in the middle. Joyful, and he wants to find profit and succor. Joyfully did I embark on the tale of paradise. So I'm reading the story of Genesis. The, the creation, a tale that is short to read, but rich to explore. My tongue read stories outward narrative while my intellect took wing and soared upward in awe. So I'm, I'm reading the thing out loud, but I'm also thinking about it, meditating upon it. As it perceived the splendor of paradise. So I'm reading this story that has 
earthly images and I'm meditating on the eternal images that they are portraying. Not indeed as it really is, but insofar as humanity is granted to comprehend it. So I'm standing in awe, I'm standing with wisdom, I'm standing with love, and I know that still I am falling short um, of the reality of paradise. And then, I forgot already, praise to your righteousness, which exalts those who prove victorious. So this is the refrain that's going on. Um, so those who prove victorious, talking about, I guess, people that get to heaven, praise to your righteousness. Who's it talking about? The righteousness of God, uh, which exalts. So God exalts us. Um, and so it's this desire. We have to persevere. We have to persevere. So he's describing heaven. Why? So that we can prove victorious. Uh, this proving victorious, this reminds us of some of Paul's language. You know, fight as if to win. Compete the race as if to win. With the eye of my mind, I gazed upon paradise, and the summit of every mountain is lower than its summit. The crest of the flood reached only its foothills. These it kissed with reverence before turning back. Um, so we look at Genesis 7.19. So the, they, the waters rose greatly on the earth and all my high mountains under the heavens were covered. So higher than the high mountains of the earth is the mountain of paradise. Um, and so this idea of the mountain of paradise, um, that's why they talk about Genesis. They always talk about the mount of Genesis and they say, oh, we have to rise up. And then you go into the temple and the temple, you go upstairs, you're rising up into this mountain. And churches, they're built with the altar as the highest point so that you rise up, you're entering into heaven. Um, and so this idea that paradise is a mountain higher than uh, the earth. And Moses, when he's designing the tabernacle, um, he says, uh, I build it according to the, the pattern that God showed me on the mountain. So this is another image um, from Exodus um, that, uh, or Numbers, um, that Ephraim is referencing. These it kissed with reverence before turning back. So um, So the water, I think it's paradise kisses the waters or paradise kisses the foothills. I'm not sure. To rise above and subdue the peak of every hill and mountain. Oh, so uh, paradise goes down and kisses every mountain. So every mountain is a sign of, um, uh, oh, no, the waters, the flood, uh, kiss the foothills of paradise. So just barely reaching the toe, like the, like if you were to imagine trying to kiss an elephant or something, like you get on tiptoe to kiss the elephant, but the elephant's above you. The foothills of paradise, it kisses while every summit it buffets. Uh, and then we go back to our refrain, praise to your righteousness, which exalts those who prove victorious. Uh, and we have to remind, remember, these could be popular hymns. These might be done within the context of the liturgy. Uh, but most likely they would be popular hymns, hymns that people would go sing on the streets, sing in the fields. And so you have a refrain. Why? So that people can sing along. Let me close this door. Not that the ascent of paradise is arduous because of its height. For those who inherit it experience no toil there. What does Jesus say? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we have Genesis, we have this idea of toil as the punishment um, for sin. So Adam's toil or labor in the field, Eve's toil or labor in childbearing. Um, so that in paradise, there's no toil. Outside of paradise, there's toil. So 
climbing up this mountain of his light. With its beauty, it joyfully urges on those who ascend. Amidst glorious rays, it lies resplendent, all fragrant with its scents. Magnificent clouds fashion the abodes of those who are worthy of it. So now the book of Revelation, uh, and I think um, Isaiah, both talk about the uh, incense that's in heaven. They have censers, and the angels are swinging around the censers. Fashion, magnificent clouds fashion the abodes of those who are worthy of it. Um, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, there are many abodes, mansions, rooms, whatever. Mm -hmm. From their abodes, the children of light descend. They rejoice in the midst of the world where they had been persecuted. So now this is maybe borrowing from um, the imagery of uh, Jacob uh, with the heavens being opened on the ladder, you know, and they're climbing and descending. This reminds us as well as in John 1 um, with Nathaniel, you shall see the heavens open and the angels ascending and descending. But then it also uh, reminds us of wisdom. Um, you know, they are at rest. They seem to be dead, but they're at rest. Um, and then the image of the children of the light. Let me see if I can find. Um, Paul says this, you're not of darkness, but children of light. And children of the day. First Thessalonians 5, 5. And John 12, 36. Believe in the light while you have so you might become children of the light. Um, so a lot of uh, references that he is using. Um, children of light descend. They rejoice in the midst of the world where they had been persecuted. They dance. So blessed are you when you're persecuted for the sake of righteousness. They dance on the sea's surface and do not sink. For Simon, although a rock, did not sink. So Matthew 14, 29, we have two images here. Peter walking on the water and not sinking. And um, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. So he's mixing these two images. of. So even though Peter was the rock, he didn't sink on the water. Blessed is he who has seen together with them his beloved ones below in their bands of disciples and on high in their bridal chambers. So blessed is he who has seen, um, which I think is heaven, uh, together with the, I mean, which is Jesus, together with them, his beloved ones, meaning us, uh, below in their bands of disciples. So that's us here on earth, and on high in their bridal chambers. So this image of the bridal chamber, um, Jesus as the, the bride, uh, you know, we hear about the five wise and the five foolish virgin, virgins. Um, we, we see some other imagery, uh, wedding imagery um, throughout, particularly the Gospel of John, but it's in some other places as well. And then we remember, we come back to this refrain, praise to your righteousness exalts those who prove victorious. The clouds, their chariots fly through the air. Each of them has become the leader of those he has taught. Um, Daniel 12, 3. Uh, the chariots flying through the air reminds us as well of Elijah, uh, his ascension. His chariot corresponds to his labors. His glory corresponds to his followers. And so this idea of we proclaim the gospel and those who enter into heaven with us uh, rejoice with us. Now, this reminds me a lot of some of these images that are images that um, C.S. Lewis uses in um, The Great Divorce, which is his kind of narrative view of heaven and hell. Blessed the person who has seen as they fly the prophets with their bands the apostles with their multitudes. The prophets have a lot of followers. The apostles have even more followers. For whoever has both acted and taught is great in the kingdom. Matthew 5, 19. 
Um, but because the sight of paradise is far removed and the eye's range cannot attain it, I have described it over simply, making bold a little, resembling that halo which surrounds the moon. So we see the moon and there's a little a glow that kind of goes around the moon. Why? Because the moon glows. So the light extends out. Why does it glow? Because the sun is shining on it. We didn't necessarily know that. We should look upon paradise as being circular too, having both sea and dry land encompassed within it. Um, and so there's this idea of, of paradise as a circle um, with sea and dry land in it, and it's kind of shining, has a halo around it. And because my tongue overflows as one who has sucked the sweetness of paradise, uh, so we hear, um, is this uh, maybe Ezekiel, where he says, oh, I tasted the word of God and it was sweet as honey. Um, I will portray it in diverse forms. Moses made a crown for the resplendent altar. So it talks about how he puts the four horns on the corners. He covers the whole thing with gold and puts a molding, a gold molding around the top of the altar. That's like a crown with a wreath entirely of gold that he crowned the altar in its beauty, thus gloriously entwined in the wreath of paradise that encircles the whole of creation. So if uh, Moses built the altar as a model of what he saw on the mountain, then the, then the altar looks like what heaven looks like. When Adam sinned, God cast him forth from paradise, but in his grace, he granted him the low ground beyond it, settling him in the valley below the foothills of paradise. But when mankind, even there, continued to sin, they were blotted out. And because they were unworthy to be neighbors of paradise, God commanded the ark to cast them out of Mount Kardu. So we say Mount Ararat, um, but in the Peshitta, it says Mount Kardu. Um, Islam adopted uh, the corruption in the Peshitta um, into uh, the Quran. Um, and so the Quran has a, has a mistake in it because it was copying the Syriac educated. Um, and so Kardu is just like a local mountain um, close to where Ephraim was and close to where the Peshitta was written. Um, and so they're like, oh, that's the mountain that Moses, I mean, that Noah uh, landed the ark on. Um, and then we go back. Um, so we have to remember, you know, here we're seeing like Genesis 6 through um, whatever, where we're talking about Noah. Uh, Praise to your righteousness, which exalts those who prove victorious. Let's go back to... Uh, the hymns on paradise, number one, paragraph 11. There, the families of the two brothers had separated. Cain went off by himself and lived in a land of Nod. So now what he's doing, he's saying that um, Adam and Eve were on the mountain of paradise, and then Noah was on the mountain of paradise. A different mountain, but every time there's a mountain, it's seen as the mountain of paradise. And Jerusalem is also the mountain of paradise. So the family, two brothers had separated. Cain went off by himself and lived in the land of Nod, Genesis 4.16, a place lower still than that of Sheth and Enosh. Um, so Enosh uh, is a descendant of Seth, um, who ascends into heaven. Seth is, a, is a, like the good brother who inherits. But those who lived on higher ground, who were called the children of God, uh, left their own region and came down to take wives from the daughters of Cain down below. This is uh, the story of the Nephilim in Genesis 6-2. The children of God, the sons of God, came and married the daughters of man. Um, and they made giants who were uh, the heroes of old. And so what are the children of, of God? What are the sons of God and the daughters of man? Does this mean angels are sleeping with women? A lot of the church fathers interpret it. Um, the children of um, Seth are marrying the children of Cain. 
And so you see in when when the, the, the Jews enter or the Hebrews enter into the promised land, they're told not to intermarry. And so it's this kind of idea of like staying with the pure and the righteous ones. Um, one twelve, the children of light dwell on the heights of paradise. The children of light are like the children of God, um, who are the sons of um, Seth, who are uh, living on this kind of step down from paradise, you know, this kind of descent down into the darkness. Dwell on the heights of paradise and beyond the abyss. They espy the rich man. So Luke 16, 26. So this is the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man sees across the abyss. He sees the bosom of Lazarus, of Abraham. He too, as he raises his eyes, beholds Lazarus and calls out to Abraham to have pity on him. But Abraham, that man so full of pity, who even had pity on Sodom, has no pity yonder for him who showed no pity. So forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. Um, you know, this idea, you had good things on earth. Now you have bad things. Abraham and his pity on Sodom. Lord, don't destroy the town if even ten. Um, the abyss severs any love. With, and this is a theologically very complicated passage, this paragraph. The abyss severs any love which might act as a mediator, thus preventing the love of the just from being bound to the wicked, so that the good should not be tortured by the sight in Gehenna of their children or brothers or family, a mother who had denied Christ and pouring mercy from her son or her maid or her daughter, who all had suffered affliction for the sake of Christ's teaching. So this kind of reminds me of like Second Maccabees. So if you imagine a mother um, and they say, if you recant your faith, we'll spare you. Encourage your son to denounce his faith. And so she goes to his son, please have mercy on me, your mother, by denouncing your faith. And the son says no. And so it would be very hard for this son to then look down at his mother, uh, who's in hell, apparently. Um, and uh, he would love her and long her. And so the abyss severs this love. The abyss says like, oh, this love doesn't act anymore. Now, I think uh, this is theologically a terrible position. Um, we're going to look at... Um, Isaac of Nineveh's position on a very, on the same question. Um, and then I'll kind of share my own theological idea. But so his idea is that we're in heaven um, and we no longer have love for our relatives who are. Um, and so we're not sad because we don't love them. Um, I think that's a that's a bad theological position. That's the position that Ephraim is holding. Why? Because he says, how can you have perfect happiness in paradise if your relatives are in hell? So this is a, a good theological question. Uh, how can you have um, happiness in paradise if uh, there's other people in hell? Like, how does that work? And this is a major theological question. This was something that was in the, the Syriac mind. This was something in the early church. This is something in the later church something even today. Um, there, the persecuted laugh at their persecutors, the afflicted at those who had caused them affliction, the slain at those who had put them to death, the prophets at those who had stoned them, the apostles at those who had crucified them. This kind of reminds me of Hebrews, uh, but it also, blessed are you when you were persecuted, it also calling to mind particular instances of stoning, the apostles at those who had crucified them. Hey, uh, who was crucified? Well, Andrew was crucified. Uh, Peter was crucified. Hey, Ephraim knows these uh, legends. The children of light reside in lofty abode. And as they gaze on the wicked and count their evil actions, they are amazed to what extent these people have cut off all hope by committing such iniquity. So not only do we not love uh, the, the people who are in hell, we're also amazed um, at how they've cut off all hope by committing such iniquity and count their evil actions. Um, and so, you know, one of the joys apparently of heaven is looking at the, uh, the hopelessness of 
the people in hell. Again, I think this is a bad position. It's a very hard question. Um, I think uh, a lot of early theologians struggled with this question. Um, again, we're going to look at Isaac of Nineveh's answer later, and then I'm going to kind of give a response to both of those. But think about it. Like, so if we're in heaven and we're happy and there's people in hell, how does that work? Um, just so we remember, there's a refrain. Um, Praise to your righteousness, which exalts those who prove victorious. Now, the other thing that we can say is that, um, but insofar as is granted to human to, to comprehend it, or, um, you know, looking at this outward narrative while looking at something deeper. So maybe we should say Ephraim is giving us an outward narrative talking about um, one aspect of hell. Uh, and not presenting a whole theology of hell. So maybe you can say like, well, he's he's saying hell is bad um, and that there's not suffering in heaven. And so um, he's, he's pushing that forward without going into the theological possibility, but it seems fairly like he's, he's also presenting a possibility. So maybe we can just say, well, we should look at this super theologically. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll get to that later. Woe to him who tries to hide his shameful deeds in the dark, who does wrong and then tries to deceive those who have seen. So this reminds me of Paul um, when he says, um, um Ephesians 5, for it is shameful even to mention what is done in the dark. Um, having gone in and committed some wrong, he lies so as to deceive those who have heard. May the wings of your grace, so Psalm 16, 17, 8. So what does that mean? Um, in the Septuagint and Peshitta numbering of the Psalms, um, we have uh, one numbering. And in the Masoretic text, we have another numbering. Uh, and that's because two psalms um, are either one psalm or two psalms, or one of them is one psalm and one of them is two psalms. So there's, it's the same text, but they push two together and separate two apart at a different interval. Um, protect. Uh, May the wings of your grace protect me, for there the accusing finger points out the daily and daily proclaims the sinner's shame and hidden dealings. So accusing finger, that kind of reminds me of uh, what happens in Daniel with Balth uh, Balthazar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, when a finger writes, you have been weighed, you have been tested, you have been found wanting. Um, what I have told must suffice my boldness. But if there is anyone who dares to go on and say, as for the dull-witted and simple people who have done wrong out of ignorance, once they have been punished and paid their debt, he who is good allows them to dwell in some remote corner of paradise where they can graze on that blessed food of the crumbs. Um, so the crumbs, we think about the, uh, the, the Syrophoenician woman. Um, there's also some other things about you will be punished until you pay every debt. Um, this place despised and spurned by the denizens of paradise, those who burn in Gehenna hungrily desire, their torment doubles at the sight of its fountains. They quiver violently. So the, those who burn in Gehenna, their, their torture is worse because they can see heaven. Um, and so he's saying, here's this one group um, about the ignorant who are who are punished halfway, uh, something akin to, to purgatory, um, you know, a period of being purified. Uh, but then he talks about how these other people are in hell and they're looking at heaven and they're not going to go there and so it makes them miserable. At the sight of its fountain, they quiver violently as they stand on the opposite side. The rich man too begs for succor, but there is no one to wet his tongue. So he says, you know, have 
Lazarus, bring me a little bit of water. So there's this image of a fountain. There's water there. Sure, there's a fountain. But there is no one to wet his tongue, for fire is within them. So the fire is like in their tongue, uh, while the water is opposite them, or the fire is on their side. Um, so there we see... Uh, you know, how, what Ephraim's doing, he's going back and forth with different passages, he's tying things in, and he's going to go through multiple hymns about the same topic. Um, and so we see, um, you know, uh, the hymns on paradise, um, hymns on the nativity, hymns the feast of the epiphany i wanted to look at that one but i'm looking at the time i don't think we'll have time on the faith um the pearl uh that's a beautiful one so this he's looking not only at scripture but also at nature so he looks at the how a, a pearl in an oyster well how did it get there well sometimes i see lightning strike the water and so it's like this divine thing strikes the water and then somehow um, maybe it's related uh, a oyster has a pearl and so it's like this heavenly treasure that's within a pearl and the way that you get a pearl is by covering yourself in oil and diving into the water stripping naked diving into the water to get this pearl and come out and so uh, to get to the pearl of great price which is Jesus which is the Eucharist you have to strip your clothes cover yourself with oil and dive into the water. So you have chrismation and baptism, and then you get to the pearl um, of great price. I'd also wanted to look on the sinful woman and on our Lord and on, here's some other ones, but I think we'll have to move on. Um, so the next uh, thing to look at is um, Afrahat. Um, always makes me think of um, a hat shaped like an afro. Uh, so he's known as the Persian sage. He's earlier than Ephraim. And he is uh, further east. Um, and supposedly he doesn't have any direct Greek influence. So sure, there's some influence, you know, just because people talk and share things. But he wasn't someone who himself studied uh, Greek philosophy or Greek theology. So he, he's like pure seriousism. And so we have this, uh, uh, his demonstrations or homilies uh, where he's proving something. Um, and there's 23 of them, I believe, um, or 22. Um, and so that's what we have from him. And so we're going to look at his demonstration number one. So it's a he's responding to a letter. I have received your letter, my beloved, and when I read it, I greatly gladdened me that you have turned your thoughts to these investigations. Investigating what? Faith. Um, for this thing that you have asked of me shall be freely granted. For freely it was received. So freely you have been given, freely give because you have freely received. Matthew 10. And whosoever has and desires to withhold from him that seeks whatever with he withholds shall be taken away from him. Um, whoever of free grace receives, the free grace also does it behoove him to give. And so, my beloved, as that which you have asked of me, so far as my insignificance has apprehended, I will write to you. And also, whatever you have not sought of me invoking God, I will explain. So I'm going to tell you what you need to know, what you asked for, and even that that you didn't ask for. Um, So I wanted to look at uh, starting at five. And if perchance 
you should say, if Christ is set for the foundation, how does Christ also dwell in the building when it is completed? For both these things did the blessed apostle say, for he said, I as a wise architect have laid the foundation, 1 Corinthians 3.10, and there he defined the foundation and made it clear, for he said as follows, no man can lay other foundation than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 3.11, and that Christ furthermore dwells in that building is the word that was written above, that of Jeremiah, who called men temples and said of God that he dwelt in them. And the apostle said, the spirit of Christ dwells in you, 1 Corinthians 3.16. And our Lord said, I and my father are one, John 10.30. And therefore the word is accomplished that Christ dwells in men, namely in those who believe in him. And he is the foundation of which, on which is reared up the whole building. So he's looking at two passages that seem like maybe they contradict. He's saying, look, they don't contradict. It's a paradox. Um, they both work. It's possible to both be in something and be the thing. Um, you know, I'm in my skin, but I'm also my skin. Um, but I must proceed to my former statement that Christ is called the stone in the prophets. For it, So now we're going to look at typology. For in ancient times, and this you'll, you'll recognize... Uh, this style in a lot of our um, cedros. For in ancient times, David said concerning him, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the building. So that's from the psalm. And how did the builders reject the stone, which is Christ? Luke 19, 14. How else than that they so rejected him before Pilate and said, this man shall not be king over us. John 19, 15. And again, in that parable that our Lord spoke, that a certain nobleman want, went to receive kingly powers and return and rule over them, and they sent after him an envoys saying, this man shall not be king over us. So he's quoting both gospels. By these things, they reject the stone, which is... So now he is putting these references. Uh, some later person is putting these references. So it's possible that he's reading the Peshitta, um, and that both of these passages are there, or it's possible that he has this four separate gospels and he's quoting both of them separately. Um, and how did it become the head of a building? He also, he, how else that it was set up over the building of the Gentiles and upon it reared up all the building and who are the builders, who but the priests and Pharisees who did not build a sure building but were overthrowing everything that he was building. As it is written in Ezekiel the prophet, he was building a wall of partition, but they were shaking it that it might fall. Uh, so Ezekiel 13.10, this is also a prophecy of Christ. Um, and again, it is written, I sought among them a man who was closing the fence and standing in the breach over the face of the land that I might, might, might not destroy it and I did not find. Ezekiel 22, 30. He did not find, so what did he do? He came himself. And furthermore, Isaiah also prophesied beforehand with regard to the stone. For he said, thus says the Lord, behold, I lay in Zion a chosen stone in the precious corner, the heart of the wall of the foundation. Here's Isaiah, another talk about the wall and the foundation. Now, what's, what's amazing, um, right now, in the modern day, it's fairly easy to do stuff like this. It's fairly easy to look up the word stone or foundation or wall or building in the Bible and see everywhere that it appears. It was much harder to do uh, when you didn't own the text yourself uh, and you had to rely on just going and hearing the texts and memorizing them or going occasionally and reading them and then leaving and then basing all of this off of these passages that you've had to memorize. And so it shows a real inter interiorization of the scriptures. Even on that, uh, everyone that believes in it shall not fear. And whoever, whosoever falls on that stone shall be broken, and everyone on whom it shall fall, will it will crush. Matthew 21, 44. I want to look at that reference. Um, Twenty-one 
As for the stone, when a man falls against it, he will break his bones. When it falls upon him, it will shatter his child. Ah, the very stone which the builders rejected has become the chief stone of the corner. Is this the Lord's doing? Marvelous in our eyes. Okay, so he's continuing on this passage that he was uh, explaining earlier. For the people of the house of Israel fell upon him. And he became their destruction forever. And again, it shall fall on the image and crush it. Daniel 2, 34. And the Gentiles believed on it and do not fear. Um, and so we're going to continue reading about the stone for the next um, three paragraphs. I'm going to keep looking. Um, and he shows thus with regard to that stone that it was laid as head of the wall and as foundation. But if that stone was laid as the foundation, how did it also become the head of the wall? How but that when our Lord came, he laid his faith in the earth like a foundation, and it rose above all the heavens like the head of the wall, and all the buildings was finished with the stones from the bottom to the top. And with regard to the faith about which I said that he laid his faith in the earth, this David proclaimed before about Christ. For he said, faith shall spring up from the earth. And that again, it is above, he said, righteousness looks down from the heaven. So faith shall spring up from the earth. Uh, search. Uh, Psalm 85, verse 11. Faith comes up like earth, from the earth like a plant. Righteousness is looking down from the heaven. So he's looking at this faith and righteousness in um psalm 85 and he's using that as an evidence for how jesus can be both the top the cornerstone and the foundation um and so how because jesus is the whole he's the bottom and the top he's the whole structure um and again also david also spoke concerning the stone which is christ for he said the stone was cut out from the mountain not by hands and it smote the image and the whole earth was filled with it. So we saw that uh, when we were reading um, Ephraim's commentary on the Gospels, when we were reading about Mary's virginity. I don't know if you remember that. Daniel 2, 34 through 35. This he showed beforehand with regard to Christ, that the whole earth shall be filled with him. For lo, by the faith of Christ are all the ends of the earth filled, as David said. The sound of the gospel of Christ has gone forth into all the earth. On forth into the earth. And again, when he sent forth his apostles, he spoke thus to them, go forth, make disciples of all nations. They will believe in me. So as David said, the sound of the gospel of Christ has gone forth into all the earth. So we, I want to look and see what the the actual word that he says. So um, the sound of Psalm one ninety Psalm nineteen verse four. Their voice has gone out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. So he uses that, and he says that that is the gospel of Christ. That that is the voice that has gone out to all the earth. So this is something uh, cool. Um, and again, when he sent forth his apostles, he spoke thus to them, go forth, make disciples of all nations. So here, David is prophesying about Christ and about the apostles. And again, the prophet Zechariah also spoke about the stone, which is Christ. For he said, I saw a chief stone of equality and love. And why did he say chief? So let's look this link up. Zechariah. Zechariah 3, um, 9. I just want to read the verse. 
See the stone I have set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it. Says the Lord Almighty, remove the sin of the land in a single day. In that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under your vine and fig tree. So that's equality and love, I guess. Uh, yeah, so he uses this, this stone tablet is the stone, is the chief stone. So he's, he's interpreting this passage this way. Um, surely, because from the beginning he was with his father, and again that he spoke of love, it was because when he came into the world, he said thus to his disciples, this is my commandment that you love one another. So why it's the chief, the chief stone, because it's about love. Um, see the stone I've set in front of Joshua. I will engrave an inscription on it and I will remove the sin of the land in a single day. So that, uh, that's Jesus. That's a reference to Jesus. Um, It's, it's, and he, I think he's also thinking about the tablet of the Ten Commandments. And again, he said, oh, and he also, he gives it to Joshua. So it's, you know, the same name, uh, Yeshua, Jesus. And again, he said, I have called you my friends, lovers, John 15, 15. And the blessed apostles said, thus, God loved us in the love of his son. Of a truth. Christ love us and gave himself for us. Ephesians 5, 2. God favored children, you must be like him. Order your lives and charity on the model of that charity which Christ showed to us. Um, and definitely did, did he show concerning the stone, lo, on this stone will I open seven eyes, Zechariah 3, 9. And what then are the seven eyes that were opened on this stone? Clearly the spirit of God. So what are the seven fruits of the spirit uh, that abide on Christ with seven operations? As Isaiah the prophet said, the spirit of God shall rest and dwell upon him, spirit of wisdom and understanding of counsel and of courage, of knowledge and of fear of the Lord, Isaiah. 11, 1 through 2, these were the seven eyes that were opened upon the stone, and these are the seven eyes of the Lord which looked upon all the earth. So now how might you see this in a liturgy? You might see, you are the stone which the builders rejected. You are the stone upon which the law of love was written. You are the stone not hewn by human hands. You are the stone, this and this and this. Um, so this is something uh, we see this kind of parallelism and repetition. So if we go back to that first quote, the repetition is good. The repetition is the point. That's what they're trying to do. Um, we might think of that, oh, that's so boring. But when we look at music, uh, music has a refrain. And the refrain repeats time and time again. And so this refrain is something that brings us comfort. Um, if you look at a piece of artwork, uh, if the whole piece of artwork is all different things, it's confusing. But what if we see a flower and then another flower and then another flower and then another flower? This gives us pattern and structure. And so this repetition um, is part of the beauty. Um, now I wanted to look at um, So there is a dissertation that somebody wrote about Afrahat's demonstrations, a conversation with the Jews of Mesopotamia. So last week, we talked a little about, about Ephraim and his relationship with Judaism. So he was there in competition, um, just like we might be in competition with football or something. He was in competition with Judaism for the, the souls and converts of his town. Um, and so Afrahat, uh, it's a similar situation. So it seems like uh, he's being mean. It seems like he's punching down, but he's fighting with people um, who were uh, his equals. He's not punching down. He's punching sideways. Whether or not he should be punching at all, uh, you know, maybe he's, he's imperfect, but he's doing it um, not as a group that he can scapegoat and punish, 
um, but fighting against people who are, um, in some cases, probably winning in arguments against him. So he's trying to uh, th present theological points, um, you know, about Judaism. Um, and so this talks about how Ephrahat has a relationship not only with um, Ephrahat did not imagine nor project the Jews in his demonstrations from his reading of the New Testament, but he and his community encountered the Jews on the streets of ancient northern Mesopotamia. Second, Ephrahat and his community, sometimes only via his community, indeed had interactions with rabbinic or more accu accurately para-rabbinic Jews. So what does that mean? He wasn't just talking about Passover as described in the New Testament. He was talking about Passover as his next door neighbors were celebrating, uh, as the church down the, as the synagogue down the street was celebrating. And he's familiar with the theological styles of the Romans. So rather than being influenced by Greek thought, He's influenced by Jewish thought. Um, so this study is structured around the general theme of ritual as addressed by Ephraim in his work. It compares the treatments of circumcision, prayer, Passover, kashrut, and fasting in Ephraim's demonstrations with the treatment of the same themes in Bavli, which is probably a, a Jewish text. In addition to dealing with primary conclusions, the research provides a set of additional or secondary conclusions. The polemical nature of both sections of the demonstration, the nature of Jewish missions to the Jewish Christians. So there's Jewish people who are trying to convince the Christians, hey, we're, we're, what we're teaching is true and what you're teaching is false. The nature of Afrahat's community, the direction of prayer, do we face the east like the Jews do, or do we face Jerusalem? Or no, do we face Jerusalem like the Jews do, or do we face the east like the rising sun? Uh, three nights and three days counting. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. I haven't read the whole, the whole dissertation yet. Treatment by Afrahat of the Christian Pascha in relationship to the idea of the Christian Sabbath. So the, um, the Christian Pascha. Uh, so... The Last Supper, the Eucharist, also Easter, and the Christian Sabbath, is it should be on the Saturday or should it be on the Lord's Day? So this kind of mixing of these two ideas. Um, so now, um, we looked at Afrahat. Now we get to look at Jacob of Saru. Most of this is just me uh, clicking from window to window. Um, Jacob of Saru um, lived from 451 to 521. So about 100 years. No, uh, his, he was born about 100 years after Ephraim died. Also called Mar, Mar Jacob, Mar Yaqub, one of the foremost Syriac poet theologians, second in nature second in stature to Ephraim, and equal to Narsai. Um, when his predecessor Ephraim is known as the harp of the spirit, Jacob is the flute of the spirit in the Antiochian Syriac Christianity, best known for his prodigious corpus of more than 700 verse homilies or memory. So he would preach uh, in music. And we have 225 of these. Um, here, um, y'all are welcome to read, uh, you know, Wikipedia articles if you want, but I kind of feel like that's not what y'all want to do. Um, share screen. So this is a really cool text. This is, um, Ephraim's homily on the Eucharist. So we're going to look and see where is he using the scripture in his homily? What is he talking about? How is he referencing this? So we've looked um, at Ephraim in his commentaries and in his poetry. 
We've looked at uh, Afrahat and his demonstrations. Um, and now we're going to look at um, Mariahub in his homilies. Come ye discerning, let us delight today. Let us delight today in the teaching, the taste whereof is sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. So again, there's a lot of biblical imagery about you eat something, you teach something, and it's sweeter than honey. The church, um, I want to pull that up. Um, So we see this in reference to uh, Rebels 10.10. 10. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. Um, and then we also see um, the manna as sweet as honey. The church in the world is a great harbor full of peace. Who's, whoso toileth, um, whoever toils, let him come in and rest at her table. Her doors are open, and her eye is good, and her heart is wide. So, let's see. Isaiah 55 1 Come, buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Come, everyone who is thirsty, come to the waters. You without money, come buy and eat. So that passage, that or similar passage is kind of what this reminds me of. Her doors are open and her eye is good and her heart is wide. Her table is full and sweet is her mingled cup to them that are worthy. You lovers of the world, come in from wandering in the evil world and rest in the inn. So now the inn, what does that remind us of? The Good Samaritan, they put some, they drop somebody off at the inn. So here he's interpreting the inn as the church that is full of comfort to him that enters it. Thou weary laborer, thou strivest to enrich thyself by vexatious toilings. Why runnest thou after riches that cannot be held fast? So weary laborer, if you're weary, come, I will give you rest. And why do you pursue riches um, that you cannot fast? That's another scripture quote. Uh, I think this is in John, do not endure, but go after something that uh, endures for eternal life. Uh, so Proverbs 27, 24. Uh, no, that's not what I want. Um, Water that endures for eternal water that endures for eternal life. The the woman at the well, I think, is um, reference maybe that he's making. This is slow. Sorry, my internet is as fast as I would like. Um. O oh, thou rich that goes astray with your riches, possess God and the wealth that after a while shall not be thine. These are all scriptural references. O oh, you unquiet soul that cleave after gold, woe to you for that which spins you with your toiling after it. Oh, see, this is a, this is a seriousism. Um, you know, you that cleave after gold, it's the gold that spins you. So it's not you that spend gold. You're not using gold for any purpose. You're just hoarding it. And so the gold is spending you. That's a, that's a beautiful turn of phrase because you're toiling after it. So you're being spent. You're being tired out for the sake of gold rather than using gold and spending it. Oh, oh you that are greedy of mammon, incline your ear hither and cast from you that grievous load which profits you not. Um, come to prayer and bring with you your whole self. Let not 
your mind remain in the market about your business? If you are here, let also your inner man be here within the doors of the crown bride. Oh, of the crown, meaning the church. Um, and the crown, meaning the bride, because in our the Maronite, in the Syriac wedding, you, you crown. So this would be a verb, this would be a noun that was feminine, and it means the crowned one. And so it would be a verb. And so this is uh, going, when you pray, pray in the inner room, um, not market in the business, uh, don't pray in the public three corners as the rich, you know, as the hypocrite who had received their reward. Rather, when you pray, go into your inner room and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And then he's comparing that to the, to the crowned room, a lot of this biblical imagery. Why is your thought gone forth and distracted after affairs? So that when you are here, you are not here, but there. Uh, this reminds me of a, a Byzantine chant. Um, let us who represent represent the cherubim now lay aside all earthly cares. Now lay aside all earthly cares. So why are you here um, but thinking about things? So he's saying, hey, you're in mass, you're in the liturgy, and you're thinking about something else. You're thinking about money. Your mind is wandering. Um, without amid the markets is your mind wind, wandering, taken up with reckonings and profit. Go out and get it, fetch it, <laughs> that it may come in and ask for its life. So you're here, go get your mind so that your mind is here too. Stand not with one half of you inside and one half without, lest when you are divided, your prayer lose itself between the two parts. Stand it united and complete and true man, and all whatsoever you ask, you can obtain. Why are you impatient? So you pray, uh, you do not receive because you pray wrongly to spend it on yourself. So something related to that. You're here in prayer, but you're thinking about money. Why are you impatient to be off when he has not given to you? So why are you so ready to go when you haven't yet received God? Like stay here and wait until God gives himself to you. Wait until you technically until you are open to receiving this gift of God. Um, so why did you come to church if you're not ready to stay here and wait around long enough until you receive it? Um, why are you impatient to be off when he has not given to you? Stay long and knock at the physician. So knock and the door will answer. The fish, physician, uh, the sick need a physician, not the healthy. You know, I am so a lot of biblical imagery beseech him and bring the tears of repentance and besprinkle his doorstep. You're knocking at the door and you're crying, tears of repentance, entreat much. And if for love he give not to you, yet to importunity. What does this remind us of? The, moment the, the man who is in the middle of the night at his neighbor, my, my neighbor, my friend came, I need some bread, come, come to the door. No, I'm not, I'm in bed. Um, be insistent at the physician's door and give not over. For if you be backward, he will not bind you up. Why stand you still? Importunity knows how to obtain mercy of him. So be persistent. Keep praying. Like you come here to, and then you get impatient and then you leave because you didn't receive anything. Keep knocking at the door. And unless he give to her, she will not suffer him to depart. Again, this biblical imagery of the, the woman uh, bothering the judge, asking for a just sentence. Oh, you penitent, be insistent, and whatever you do ask, you shall receive it from the giver of all things good. Um, Ephraim has a famous quote. He says, um, he talks about, he says, there's only one baptism, one forgiveness of sins, uh, but for a splattering, there is a sprinkling. So there's a forgiveness of sins through baptism. But then for a splattering, a new sinning, like becoming dirty again, there is a sprinkling, uh, another washing. And this washing is what? The washing of tears. So it's kind of a Syriac thought. Why are you impatient to be gone about your business? Why are you 
disquieted to depart and go about your affairs? Why run after the world, which may not be kept fast? You won't be able to keep the world forever. Why are you chasing it? Why have you spent your days in vanity? Why are the hours of the church esteemed by you as idleness? Why is not the service accounted by you as a banquet? Why are you diligent when you do your own work, but remiss and cold and slack in asking? So you should feel good. The, the early Syriac uh, Christians uh, were, were terrible Christians just like us. Um, mercy has brought you into this house that is full of profit. Think it not loss if you remain long herein. Be patient and listen to the sound of the psalms which the finger of the prophecy played, smoked to the words of David. So they sing the psalms in church. In the Syriac liturgy, there's a lot of psalms. In the Maronite liturgy, traditionally, there's a lot of psalms. Hearken to the hymns, madrashi, sung by the chaste women with voices of praise. So Ephraim had a women's choir. Apparently still they have these women's choirs. This is a, a big thing in the Syriac church, which the wisdom of the highest has given to the congregations. Here the prophets, who as it were through pipes, pipes of choice gold, pour forth from their mouths life into the ears of men. Um, I don't entirely get that reference, but somehow there's some kind of medicine or something that you or through pipes into the ears of men. I don't know. Um, hearken to the apostles, who like the channels of rivers are open, and water the king's garden with lofty streams. Uh, that's a reference to paradise, to Genesis. Bend your ear to the pulpit, the bima, of the Godhead, and receive from it precious pearls. So this is the pearl of great price. Give assent to the two testaments, rivers both, which hold for thee life unending. Hear the new and hearken to the old and see that in both one truth is spoken unto you. So, uh, lo, you hear from the old of the four rivers which flowed from the blessed source of Eden. And again, in the new, you have the apostles like four rivers, meaning the four evangelists, who went forth into the four corners of the world. Oh, I guess not. So the 12 apostles going out to the four corners of the world and learn them. Life flows from the service of the house of God. Um, this uh, is a beautiful um, uh, image in the Old Testament. Um, water gushing from the side of the temple. In Ezekiel, I saw water flowing out from beneath the threshold of the temple toward the east. At first it trickled, then it became deeper and deeper. Um, Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12. Uh, life flows from the service of the house of God. So what is this water? In Ezekiel, he's talking about life that's flowing from the church. You lovers of life, refuse not the profit that comes thereof. The soul of man is receptive to impressions or operations, and in whatsoever she meets, she is dyed with all and becomes that color. So if you hear the words, if you hear the psalms, if you hear the prophets, if you hear the scriptures, um, you will start to look like the scriptures. When she hears the dirges of the wailing woman, women, she overflows with grief. So now he's looking at the natural world and out tears out of the departed. And when she hears the songs and jests of the actors, she waxes wanton, that with a loud voice she may pour forth laughter. When she hears evil reports, dread comes upon her. But if she hears good tidings, she is glad. And every wind that blows toward her moves her. And in whatsoever direction it be, each time she turns. When then she hears the sound of the service of God's house, Spiritually, she, I guess the soul, is moved with love towards God. And as it were, she despises the evil world and its affairs and comes and, and mingles with these godly meditations. She cleaves to and loves that spiritual conversation. So hear the word of God as much as you can. 
Why? Because then you'll start to go in that direction or start to look like that. And then here he talks about the church in the world is like a scribe to men and she teaches and makes them wise. So a scribe teaches, the church teaches and binds up the sores of all who come to her. Um, so this is like, again, like the, the inn um, in the um, Good Samaritan. And from her teaching, the soul draws light that she may overcome the darkness of death when it's her. Come, enter, you foolish, that were stained with lusts, and furbish your lives with the doctrine of the daughter of lights. So the daughter of lights, I guess, is the church. Be not impatient to be gone from the supper which the bride of the whole world has made. So you have the wedding feast of the Lamb in Revelation, that we should delay her and go not forth as soon as the consecration is begun. Um, so apparently people are coming to church just to hear the sermon, and then they're leaving the sanctuary before receiving communion. Um, for thou art a son of the household, not a stranger. Uh, so that so they send out the demons after the um, um, So they're saying, oh, well, then we're going to go out too. <laughs> uh, maybe this was even um, a talk to the catechumens i'm not sure i'd have to look it up when thou hearest whoso has not received the sign rushma let him depart do not you depart who are signed yea and brought near so before uh proclaiming the creed all of the catechumens would leave why because they're not yet ready to proclaim the creed because they're still coming to faith they're not yet ready to receive the eucharist why? Because they're outside of communion. Do not you depart. Be you one of the household of the at the hour of the trees. So the mystery, uh, Raze. Do not um, Teshmeshto de Raze Kadishe, the service of the holy mysteries. That's what we call the mass or the liturgy. Do not thou get up and go forth and become as one of the externs. You are signed with the sign. You are stamped with the stamp. Among the brethren, you are written. So your name is written in the book of life. Um, you are signed uh, with the mark of the Tau. Again, I think that's Ezekiel um, and I think Revelation as well. Why should you go forth with the unsigned as one that comes short? Him who is not baptized, the priest drives out when he is about to consecrate. Not you does he drive out who are one baptized of the divinity baptism daughter of lights is the king's sign and you have put on the great sign why should you go forth with the oil you have been signed sign these so the chrismation with the cross of light your face is signed it is so oil is often a symbol of light so when they use the oil and then there's the light so with the cross of light your face is signed it means they made the sign of cross on your forehead and oil as you are signed that they say let him go forth then the sign of life has made you a brother of the only begotten and a son of his father and you are in the household you should not go forth remain within the door and cry abba our father for you being a son it is permitted to you to cry our father so in the um in baptism one of the things that we do is we teach the person the Our Father so that they're able to say the Our Father uh, in the Maronite rite of baptism. Whoso is not baptized for this reason, do they drive him out when, they con when the consecration is begun, that it is not permitted to him to call the Heavenly One Our Father. And whoso is not baptized, his number is not set among the sons. And if he should call the Father Our Father, it is a lie. For this cause, they say, whoso has not received the sign, let him depart. That a lie may not be uttered among them that are true. Forth they drive him out, with the, with born with the second birth, lest he should dare to cry. So the second birth, that's the, the biblical imagery, the Our Father, quoting the scriptures, with the many, and make use of a word that is full of lying um, in the pure congregation. 
which daily sings those things that are true. Wherefore, when they drive out the unbaptized one, do you enter in? For it is easy for you to cry, our father. You are born with the second, the spiritual birth. It is fitting for you to cry, the father, our father, stay and cry. So he keeps going, talks about the bridegroom. Um, and he gets, it's either this one or the next one where he, uh, so he starts talking about the Eucharist and the meaning of the Eucharist. Um, and he's explaining uh, the whole meaning of the mass. It's really, it's a, it's a passage, a uh, cool homily. Um, the, the bread and wine, our Lord made body and blood, uh, which thing Melchizedek also thus depicted mystically. So Melchizedek in the book of Genesis with Abraham a high priest who was more excellent than Abraham sacrificed bread and wine to God and nothing besides. Uh, also Hebrews references this. And he taught the earth that the bread and wine is the body and blood which the Son of God gave to the world to be pardoned with all. And on the eve of the passion of the, mis the mystery shone forth from our Savior. So this is the Last Supper, the book of reference, who broke his body and gave to his apostles as we have said. Here let the soul of him who is to speak, clothe itself in awe, for save with awe, the Son of God may not be spoken of. So here he's talking about himself. I need to clothe myself with awe. I need to be in fear of the Lord uh, because of how great this mystery is. Let our mind glow with the fire of love that eats up stumbling and doubts, and then let it look upon the Son of God with faith that leaps over pits and gulfs. Our discourse shall run, and thus it shall not have fallen among the disputers. So not only we, should, we shouldn't even talk about the Eucharist without being covered in awe. We shouldn't approach the, the Eucharist without uh, being overcome with awe. His body with his hands, our Lord divided upon the table. And who is he that will dare to say now that it was not the body? He said, this is my body. And who will not affirm it? For if he affirm it, not he, for, he, for if he affirm it not, he is no disciple of the apostleship. The apostles assented to him, and while he was alive and reclining with them, they ate him, and dead whilst living, they knew him to be without doubting. If he were not dead, then his bread was not his body, and if he were not alive, he would not have broken his body and given to his apostles. He broke the bread and made it the body and gave to his apostles, and the taste of the body wherein was life was in their mouths. From when he took it and called it body, it was not bread, but his body. And it, or him, him they were eating whilst they marveled. So we see um, if Jacob of Sarug is familiar with the Greek, uh, the, the word it, um, it, take, eat it, all of you, uh, it's a reference to body. The same, it's the same gender as body and not the same gender as bread uh, within scripture. Um, they eat his body and he is reclining with them at the table and they drink his blood and they hear the voice of his teaching. They affirm that he is slain while they look upon him alive and speaking. So they at the last supper are going forward in time and entering into eternity. We are looking backward in time and into eternity. They affirm that he is slain while they look upon him alive and speaking. He is mingled with them while they eat him without doubt. Faith is bright and stands manfully and doubts not either that he is alive or that he is slain and he reclines slain at the table and is not investigated and they drink his blood and affirm that it is his blood while he is alive. So how do they affirm it? By drinking. How do they affirm it? By eating. Because he said, this is my body. If they said, no, it's not, they wouldn't have eaten. And there are not there neither priors nor disputers. So they're not trying to figure out how it's going. They're not trying to uh, con comprehend and dissect it rather not investigators not yet scribes of wise opinions they were not questioning when there was place to ask do you indeed call it body lord when low it is bread faith stoops not to questioning she knows to affirm to investigate she has never learned the apostles were anxious to assent to the son so here this whole time he's investigating and he's saying look they proceeded with faith to the eucharist they who could have asked jesus they could have been investigated, and yet they were overcome by faith. And so we who are unable to ask, why are we looking into this investigation? 
uh, when they were able to ask, the apostles were anxious to the son not to investigate or question as daring men. The bread that he broke and called his body, body they knew it to be, and thus they thought that, yeah, in truth, his blood was dropping there. Who would have been able to sacrifice the son before his sire? Um, sire. Let me look up that word. So sire, the male parent of an animal, especially a stallion or bull kept for breeding. Um, so maybe this is like before God the Father. Um, he, he, our Lord, is the high priest of the perfect sacrifice, and therefore he sacrificed himself before his Father. He is the dead who, when dead, was alive and was not investigated. So do you all remember, we pray something like this uh, in the liturgy. Um, the high priest uh, who offered himself, the lamb who was sacrificed, um, priest and burnt offering, whom to examine is too high for the disputers. He broke and divided his body with his hands to 12, who, if they had not seen how he broke, would not have broken. So they would have been afraid to break if they hadn't seen him break. He stood as priest and performed the priest's function upon himself among his disciples that he might depict the type of priesthood for it to imitate. Um, he taught them how to break his holy body and distribute it to the sons of the household of the faith. He made known to them how they should drink the cup of his blood and gave. And so Paul says, I have handed on to you what I have also received. Give the notions and worlds and regions to drink of it. With his blood, he sealed the new covenant, which he made that it might be for remission of debts forever. Simon, he taught, and to John, he gave an example that he did, they should be doing when he was taken. Um, so here we see uh, kind of two um, uh, two homilies um, of Jacob of Sarug, where he's going through the mass. Uh, maybe they would be called mystagogical. They're explaining trees. Um, so now the last person we're going to look at, Isaac of Nineveh. So Isaac of Nineveh uh, from 613 to 700. So he's even later um, known as the Persian sage. He talks about asceticism, so the, the monastic life. Uh, life where you leave the world behind. Um, faith, God's providence, prayer, obeying God, love toward your neighbor. Uh, and it mentions universal reconciliation. If we have time, we'll get to that. Sure. Um, Isaac of Nineveh. Okay, we're going to be on page 57. Six treatises on the behavior of excellence. The fear of, so let's look and see how he uses uh, scripture in his uh, exhortations to the monks. The fear of God is the foundation of excellence. So what do we hear in the scriptures? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. For excellence is said to be the offspring of faith. It is sown in a man's heart when he allows his mind to confine the wandering impulses to continual meditation on the order of things to come away from the distractions of the world. So no longer are we distracted. Now we're focused entirely on heaven. As the foundation of excellence, uh, the first among its peculiar elements is the concentration of the self by freeing it from practical things upon the enlightened world of the straight and the holy ways, the word that by the inspired psalmist is called the teacher. So he's referencing the Psalms. There is scarcely to be found a man who is able to bear honors or possibly 
such a, a one exists not because man is very prone to err, even if he be an angel in his way. The foundation of the way of life consists in accustoming. So there's the way of life and the way of death. This is something that goes back to the, to the Didache and something that goes back to the book of Proverbs. So I think here he's, he's making a, um, a citation of Proverbs. So I want to look at um, Proverbs 1. Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction of fruit behavior, doing that is right. Um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Um, let's see uh, the way of life. Um, Proverbs. No, I want to look at the way of life songs. Uh, life in the way of life. Um, Isaiah 30, verse. Okay, I'm not able to find this reference. Um, I know it's in um, I know it's in Didache. I, I want to say that it's in the Psalms, but I'm, I'm not recalling the verse. Foundation of the way of life consists in accustoming the mind, the words of God and the practice of patience. For the draught provided by the former, is helpful toward acquiring perfection in the latter. So accustoming the mind to the words of God in the practice of patience. So this is what the, um, the uh, spiritual life is about. Further increased development toward accomplishment in the latter will cause a heightened desire in the former. So as you grow in patience, um, you'll read the scriptures more. You'll reflect on the scriptures more. And the help provided by both of them Will quickly bring about the rise of the whole building. No one is able to come near to God, save only he who is far from the world. Uh, this is a scriptural reference. Um, no one knows God except he who is from God. No one knows the Father ex except the Son. Um, For I do not call separation the departure from the body, but from the bodily things. Excellence consists therein that a man, and when we think about excellence, we can think about the word virtue might be a better translation, that a man in his mind be a void as regard to the world. As long as the senses are occupied with outward things, it is not possible for the heart to rest from imagining them, nor the affection cease, nor evil thoughts in except in the desert and the wilderness. While the soul has not yet become drunk by the faith in God in that it has received an impression of its powers, the weakness of the senses cannot be healed. It is not able to tread down with coarse visible matter, which is a screen before it's within and not perceived by the senses. Um, reason is the cause of freedom and the fruit of both liability to err. Without the first, the second cannot be. And where the second fails, there is the third bound, as it were, with altars. When grace is abundant in man, then the fear of death is despised on account of the love of righteousness. Finds many arguments in proving that it is becoming to bear troubles for the sake of the fear of God. And those things which are supposed to injure the body and to repel nature unjustly, which consequently are of a nature to cause suffering, are reckoned in his eye as nothing in comparison with what is expected to be. So there's some biblical allusions here, um, but he's not making explicit. Uh, biblical quotations. Um, if we go to the um, 
end of the book. It has the biblical quotations that he made. Uh, the passage that he quotes the most uh, is Romans 8, chapter 15. So I wanted to look at that. Um, this is the passage that he's quoting uh, four times. The spirit you received did not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. So that's the passage that he quotes the most um, in this uh, explanation of, um, of the ascetical life. Uh, you can go and, and look there to go more of the passages. But he, he doesn't do as much um, of this kind of Syriac writing. Uh, he's, he's doing something that's more kind of systematic. Um, he's doing something that's coming more from a tradition of ascetical life. He's saying, look, this is the experience that we've had over the years in the ascetical life. Now, I wanted to look um, the last thing at um, you're going to say, why am I reading this rant blog? Well, it's he wrote about the topic I wanted to, and he quotes the text that I wanted to quote. So the triumph of the kingdom over Gehenna. So um, famous words by St. Isaac the Syrian, those who are punished in Gehenna are, are scourged by the scourge of love. Those who are punished in Gehenna are scourged by the scourge of love. These famous words of St. Isaac the Syrian have profoundly influenced the Orthodox understanding of hell and damnation. Readers of St. Isaac's writings have for centuries assumed that this mystical insight represents the apex of his reflections on damnation. Um, so what would this mean? Um, you commit adultery and you go to your wife and you said, I've committed adultery and I hate you and I'm going to run away with my new spouse. And your wife says, I still love you. And you say, no, I want you to hate me so that I can, so that I can leave with good conscience. And she says, no, I love you. I'll not stop loving you. I'll not stop praying for you. You're still my husband. No, I hate you. I'm mad. Um, or you imagine a little kid. He says, I want to stay home and play video games. And your mom says, no, we're going to go to Disney World. Um, and he says, oh, I hate you. I'm just going to sit in the car. And you're like, but we're at Disney World. Like, come in. I'm just going to sit and I'm not going to ride any rides. And I'm not going to try any food. I'm so this kid is miserable um, because of the love. Um, so this was considered the apex of his reflections on the nation. In 1983, Sebastian Brock discovered complete text. Um, of what's called the second part, a text that had long been, uh, it's, it's a very great name, the second part. Uh, the other one was called the first part. Um, so it's three homilies specif specifically devoted to the last things. Um, so the dam may be scourged by the scourge of love, and this person's theory is, but the scourging is not forever. So this idea of an apocastasis or universalism. So people go to hell temporarily. So there's not really a hell. There's just a purgatory. Or maybe there's like light purgatory and a heavy purgatory, which is hell. But eventually you get out like even the demons. So uh, here's the passage that they read. For it would be most odious and utterly blasphemous to think that hate or resentment exists within even against demonic beings, or to imagine any other weakness or possibility or whatever else might be involved in the course of retribution of good or bad as applying in a retributive way to that glorious divine nature. So, so far, I would agree uh, that God uh, loves everyone. He even loves the devil. Why? Because God is love. And he continues to allow the devil to exist. Why? Because he created the devil good, he holds the devil in existence because he loves, he is love. Um, and so the souls in hell, God loves them. 
and their punishment, the scourging is the scourging of love. Um, and that we shouldn't think of hell as retribution, um, but rather as something else. So it's not retribution. Now in purgatory or in purgation, people that are in to paradise but need to be purified, what do they face? They face restorative justice. So justice that's made to make them better, like going to physical therapy. Um, so uh, God loves everybody. God is love. He doesn't have hate within him. And he's not punishing us out of retribution. So both of these things, I think that we can hold as true. Rather, he acts towards us in ways he knows will be advantageous to us. I think we can believe that that's true, whether by way of things that cause suffering or by way of things that cause relief, whether they cause joy or grief, whether they are insignificant or glorious, all are directed toward the single eternal good, whether each receives judgment or something of glory from him, not by way of retribution, far from it, but with a view to the advantage that is going to come from all these things. So God is always giving out good. He's always offering us. Love. Okay, I think, I think all of this we can still hold. That is how everything works with him, even though things may seem otherwise to us. With him, it is not a matter of retribution, but he is always looking beyond to the advantage that will come from his dealing with humanity. And one such thing is this matter of Gehenna. So you're saying even Gehenna is for the advantage, is for good. So I think, well, if God made Gehenna, it has to have some good purpose. Even perdition is encompassed within God's salvific plan for humanity. Um, so here, I think he's uh, jumping. Um, so he uses the word perdition. Um, a state of eternal punishment and damnation into which a sinful and unrepentant person passes after death. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to say, yeah, that's fine. Um, so even perdition and eternal punishment is within God's plan. Um, and it can be used for our good and eternal happiness. The claim that the father of Jesus Christ will abandon his children to eschatological memory, misery is unthinkable, indeed impious. Um, okay, even that, I think, uh, I think we can agree with even that, this statement that's not by Isaac of Nineveh, but by this writer. Um, Eternal damnation is unworthy of God revealed in Jesus Christ. So now that statement, I think he is um, jumping the gun. So Christ, the, the claim that the father of Jesus Christ will abandon his children to eschatological misery. No, Jesus will never abandon them. He will always keep holding them in existence. He will always keep loving them. But some people don't want to be loved. And we are free enough that we can reject love. And so on earth, we have temporary uh, sins uh, and we'll receive temporary purifications for them. Uh, but if we sin in eternity, if we make the eternal decision to reject love forever, we've rejected love forever. Uh, that's it. That's eternity. That's, that's what eternity is. Eternity isn't sequential time where we say, oh, I, I rejected love forever, but now I don't anymore. That's a illogical statement. Um, and so eternal damnation uh, is what? It's not God punishing the person. It's the person, it's God loving the person and the person not wanting that love. Um, and so the only thing that we can say is, uh, well, why doesn't God force them to love me? Uh, well, what is it called? When you force somebody to love you, uh, it's not called love. Um, you know, it's called abuse. It's called rape. Um, and so if God distorts our will, even for our good, uh, this is something that's bad. And so the idea of free will uh, here, this guy, I think, is misunderstanding. Um, so I am of the opinion, announces St. Isaac, that he is going to manifest some wonderful outcome, a matter of immense and ineffable compassion on the part of the glorious creator with respect to the ordering of this difficult matter of Gehenna's torment. Out of it, the wealth of his love and power and wisdom will become known all the more, 
and so will the insistent might of the waves of his goodness. Um, you know, so it it so there's um, people, and you can keep reading this article. Um, so here's an, another quote: "If the kingdom of Gehenna." kingdom and Gehenna had not been foreseen in the purpose of our good God as a result of the coming into being of good and evil actions, then God's thoughts concerning these would not be eternal. But righteousness and sin were known by him before they revealed themselves. Accordingly, the kingdom and Gehenna are matters belonging to mercy, which were conceived of in their essence by God as a result of his eternal goodness. It was not a matter of requiting, even though he gave them the name of requital. Um, so what's another thing that you could say? You could say everyone is invited into heaven. Some people are happy about it. Some people are miserable. Everyone is invited into heaven. Uh, everyone is loved by God. Some people are happy about it. Some people are miserable about it. And we should further say or think that that's not what Isaac of Nineveh is saying. He seems to be saying, I don't understand how this is possible. Um, now, uh, I think St. Anselm, uh, the, the position that I hold uh, goes back to St. Anselm, uh, who's writing in the fourth century. Um, and I think he does the best job of, of explaining uh, basically the gospel of John. <laughs> you know, God is love. Uh, I think he does the best, best job of explaining this, um, that we should say or think that the is not full of love and mingled with compassion and an opinion full of blasphemy and insult to our Lord God by saying that he will even hand us over to burning for the sake of suffering, torment, and all sorts of ills. We are attributing to the divine nature and enmity toward the very rational being which he created through grace. So no, that's not what we're saying. We're not saying that he's handing us over. We're saying he's always trying to embrace us. And if we choose sin and eternity, we're eternally rejecting. Um, so Ephraim, he talks about, oh, we love for the people in hell. Uh, so that's how he gets over it. Well, we're not going to care about people in hell anymore. And their sin is really bad, so they deserve it. Um, and Isaac, he takes the other extreme. He says, well, um, you know, uh, God is going to punish these people for a while, but eventually God is going to stop being mad or something. And they're going to change. You know, I don't know. It, it, like, that's not how God works. Um, and so this idea of God will continue to love us forever. Um, and that we are free to accept that love or to reject that love. And when we enter in eternity, we'll accept that love forever or we'll reject that love forever. Um, this guy doesn't understand foreknowledge. Um, and so he talks about St. Isaac's horror of a perduring hell. So if we think that hell is um, God taking vengeance um, on somebody forever. So, hey, uh, you know, in the Latin church, they talk about a Sunday mass, missing Sunday mass is a mortal sin. So, hey, you've missed Sunday mass once, you've committed a mortal sin. And because you missed Sunday mass once, even though you went every other day of your life, um, I'm going to punish you in hell uh, by torturing you and whipping you forever. Like, that would be horrible. <laughs> you know, that would be uh, a, a horror. That would be a terrible God. Um, but if we say, um, you skipped mass because you were rejecting me, and then you died, and then you said, I will continue to reject you forever. And God says, I love you. And you say, ah, I'm so mad because you're loving me and I'm rejected. Um, so anyway, so that's a, kind of an interesting. Um, some interesting points. Uh, I'm going to stop. So those are uh, maybe the four greatest uh, Syriac theologians. Uh, Ephraim, Jacob of Sarug, Isaac of Nineveh, um, and Aphrahat. Um, there's a few others, uh, I believe, that we'll be looking at next week, some lesser known. Um, we might even look at a few of the, uh, like Bar Daisum, who's a who invented kind of the hymnody method, um, but was uh, heretical. 
um, we might look at some of his, um, and then we'll enter into the kind of third section of the course, which is liturgical and lectionary use for the last two classes. Um, so if anyone has any questions uh, that they want on camera, we'll answer those and then I'll turn the camera off and if anyone has any other questions or thoughts. Uh, if you don't mind, um, you know, looking at this whole idea of universal salvation, it seems like it was common among certain church fathers, such as Origen, as well as even uh, modern thinkers, such as von Balthasar in his book, There We Hope. But kind of looking at this whole idea then of sonship, which has been kind of, uh, kind of a theme tonight, on the other on the other side, um, looking at what it really means to be a child of God through adoption and baptism, one of the things that's striking me that I'm not hearing is the idea of divinization. Was that really a theme going on um, there in the Syriac tradition, or is that much more of a Byzantine uh, overall emphasis in theology? Um, so we didn't we didn't look a lot at that topic. Um, we did look about being clothed in glory, um, and we did look about becoming firstborn sons and becoming holy. Um, but we we didn't really get into um, divinization uh, in, in today's topics. Um, and yeah, I I know von Balthasar. He talks about uh, universal salvation for people. Um, he doesn't seem to imply universal salvation for angels. So you have the angels, you have the devils. He seems to think that the devils continue on in hell. Um, that, that's true. And in, in one sense, I mean, because he even poses a question, is Judas really even in hell? And in one sense, his idea of hell seems to be almost devoid of any beings. He still maintains, in one sense, the idea of hell, but it seems to be very barren. Um, so the, the, the question, um, we, we can look at some of these theological questions. Um, and uh, what we what we don't want to do is say, well, everyone's going to get to heaven, uh, and heaven is eternal, and so punishment is temporary, and so in the in the length of things, uh, hell, you know, a, a million year purgatory or whatever will be nothing in comparison to eternity, um, and so there is no impetus for me to do anything. There's no impetus for me to uh, pray. There's no impetus for me to um, worship God. Um, there is, is no relationship between um, my action or my love um, and my ability to receive love. So even the Our Father is wrong. So forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. Like even that is, uh, is an error. Um, and so, um, you know, it seems like uh, we're just ignoring Christ. <laughs> you know, it seems like um, we're just ignoring Paul. Like, um, faith comes by hearing, you know, uh, and how will they hear if nobody preaches? How will they preach uh, if no one is sent? Um, and so, you know, we can say like, oh, well, I know I'm a failure, but that's okay because God is going to take care of all of this in the end. Um, and so uh, then what it leads to is like, well, then I don't really love my neighbor. Like I have no, I, I, um, I'm loving my, or to say I'm loving my neighbor by doing nothing. I'm loving my neighbor by not praying for their conversion. I'm loving my neighbor by avoiding it. And so there's a, there's a, there's a problem. Um, with uh, uh, doing this, and now there's a theological issue that he's trying to that he's trying to fight against, which is, oh, is God unjust? Is God hateful? Uh, is God vengeful? 
but there's other ways of addressing this question without falling into, um, you know, God's not vengeful, so you might as well do whatever you want. Um, I, I think um, maybe another way of rephrasing the the issue is, and I, I frankly I found Isaac of, of Nineveh to be pretty hopeful. Um, I'd never, I'd, I'd really never read or, or, or didn't know much about him. But um, if God's plan from all eternity is for salvation, and he reaffirmed that salvation and made it possible through his son Jesus, his incarnation, his death, and his resurrection, and the sending of the Spirit. Um, and again, um, Paul affirms that that God wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of, of truth. Um, will God's desire for humanity as a whole, but certainly for each individual in particular, will God's desire be unfulfilled? Will God's intention be thwarted um, ultimately? So, I, I mean, I'm, I don't know, I, I have, I know what the church teaches and I, I assent to it for sure. Um, I can believe that there is a hell, but I can also believe that there doesn't have to be anybody in it um, necessarily. Uh, is, who can know the mind of God who has been God's counselor as, as uh, the Psalms say, but, um, but certainly what is God's intention in, in offering us his son, Jesus, to be our savior? Is that we'd be saved. We can, we can thwart God's intention. We can sin. We can turn our backs on, on God. And I guess what Isaac is is asking, or I'm asking in uh, in some ways, or questioning, I guess, do we have the capability of doing that definitively? So we have freedom. Mm -hmm. How absolute is our freedom um, in this life? If we're all, if we are conditioned, we're conditioned by our families, our social circumstances. We're so, conditioned I mean, by in, sin. In this life, it's not absolute because we're with our bodies. Mm -hmm. But when we die, uh, we will be given absolute freedom. Yeah, there's some some folks who talk about the final option um, that the general direction of our life will. Will certainly um, color the option we make at death. Whether that's so, yeah, so, so final or option or, or fundamental option is another way that I've that I've heard about it. Um, and so they'll say like, oh well, it's okay um, if you are presumptuous about one sin, um, as long as you're pretty good about everything else. Like, no, like we we shouldn't presume on the mercy of God. Yeah. Um, and so um, uh, this idea of, um, you know, if um, so every every angel at the moment of their creation, given the knowledge that they needed to be able to make a free decision for God or against God. Um, and so in that moment, they made the decision for God or against God. Um, and if we are a little less than the angels, uh, you know, we, uh, we're given kind of a life and then a moment, <laughs> you know, to make this decision. Um, and, um, you know, if, um, God's not going to force us. He can, he can love us. He can do whatever, but he can't, he, he has promised not to force our will. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, uh, thank you all. I'm going to stop the screen share. I mean, the, the recording.